In addition to being a matter of life and death, a pandemic limits our degrees of freedom. It, it, it puts a straitjacket on, on our movement, limits what we can do and, and uh, defines what we should not do. Now, human beings do not like being restricted. Toddlers who want to be on the run resist being held or worse, sent to bed. Uh, you, you know, that desire to do what we want to do when we want to do it never really goes away. Some people are so sensitive to being restricted, uh, they won't even wear a mask. They, they don't want one more restriction placed upon them. I want to invite you to join me in investigating your restrictions. If you will, to touch the skin the pandemic has burned and see what we can learn from it. So if you're willing, take out a pencil and a piece of paper or open up your uh, iPad, the notes on your iPad or on your phone, full screen, big piece of paper, not a little one. And while you're doing that, I'm going to ask you a series of, uh, of seven questions, like the seven sacraments. And you write down your answers to each question. You may, may have more than one answer for each question. That's perfectly fine. Okay, ready? First, what do you miss? What do you miss? Second, who do you miss? Who do you miss? Third, what makes you angry about this? What makes you angry? Fourth, what hurts? What hurts? Fifth, if you could, what would you do again this very minute? If you could, what would you do again, right away? And the sixth question, if you could, what would you do for the first time? What would you do for the first time? And seventh, what do you notice is more important to you now than before all this began? More important to you now than it was before all this began. Now, I ask these questions not to rub salt into wounds, and I'm not even going to talk about healing from the wounds you and losses that you've experienced. Some wounds are permanent, some transitory. And it's not that they're unimportant. And in some cases, they need and they deserve attention. However, today, I want to look at them from a different perspective. You know, in the Gospels, there's a group of people, and they're blind people, and they're calling out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And these blind protesters overcome the disciples' blockade, and they finally get to Jesus. And Jesus asks, what do you want? Which has to be, if I'm one of the blind, the dumbest question I have ever heard. What do you think I want? A bagel and cream cheese? I'm blind. Guess what? I want to see. Isn't that obvious? Well, Jesus isn't being flippant or, or dense. He needs them to ask for what they want. They have to own their own prayer. Jesus can't make their prayer for them. He can't dictate their future. And he knows that what they want directs the future of their soul. The American psychologist Gordon Alport believes the same thing. What we want 
directs our personality. You know, much of psychology is, is spent going over past events. But when that's all said and done, we still have to go forward from where we stand, however it is that we got there. Alport believed desire, appetite, our goals, they create us. So in the midst of pandemic, between increasing illness and hopeful vaccination, I'm suggesting that the key to recovery, or at least a root of recovery, is found in your answers to the questions I posed a few minutes ago. So let me explain as I go over these questions once again. What you miss, who you miss. It identifies what's important to you. Important to you before the pandemic, important to you during the pandemic, important to you when all this is over, whatever it is that looks like. Now, COVID-19 robs us of a, of a sense of taste and smell, realistically and metaphorically. When you have been without something for so long, we can lose our memory of, of what is delicious in our lives. So I'm going to suggest that you look at that list, not as a record of losses, but rather a record of who and what you hunger for. And whatever the new normal is, and no one quite knows, they are your priorities. What you look forward to and work towards. What makes you angry? What hurts you? That's frustrating and painful. But they're not just the source of distress, for they also reveal your sense of justice and injustice. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus said. An encouragement not to be blasé about the world around us. An encouragement to make a difference. You know, when the Capitol building was stormed, America became angry. Something precious to us was, was defiled. When we saw those police battered by rioters, we became angry. People should not be treated that way. You know, in medicine, we call a wound an insult. Insult. Stay with that word for a moment. When you hurt, you have been insulted. Part of you that is precious has been insulted. And our hurt helps us identify that part of us that needs to be love, insult that needs to be replaced with respect. Anger. Anger defends us. Anger rouses us. It commands our attention. It organizes us to, to repel the assault that's against us, against what we believe, uh, against those whom we hold precious. Anger does not like to sit still. It likes to move, to defend, to attack. What makes you angry tells you something about what you hold dear, what it is you reverence. It motivates you to protect. Anger is a little dicey because it's an emotion that that can feed itself like a California wildfire until it screams all out of proportion, destroying everything in its path, making us actually less aware of what is truly dangerous. The key is to listen to your own anger. Identify what it is you want to protect and be motivated to do it. 
then you have to let it calm down. So you leave room for your whole brain to prepare an effective course of action that actually works rather than burning out of control. What you would do again this minute and what you would do for the first time, they're important questions to ask because they're clear goals that we need to pursue even if we have to find a new way to do it. In an unpredictable world that in some ways may just not be the same again, our tendency to focus on our lack of ability, the capacities we have lost, that has to be resisted. Just because they're diminished, or even if they're completely gone, doesn't mean we can never achieve our desires. It does mean we have to be creative in pursuing them. You know, evolution is a series of adaptations to ever-changing circumstances. And human beings are designed to change themselves. We are hardwired with the capacity to imagine something that's never existed, and then imagine how to get there. That's how we landed on the moon. And that's how we're trying to inoculate an entire planet, something we've never done before. It doesn't mean we can't do it. It just means we haven't figured it out yet. The American poet Emily Dickinson said, my sister lives in the state of regret, but my country is hope. We cannot lose sight of our home country called hope. Finally, what you notice more now than you did before tells you something about the change within you. Evolution has two types of change. The primary being a slow procession of time. So gradual is it we're not even aware that we've changed direction at all. The other type is, of course, cataclysmic. Severe drought, ice age, meteor hits the earth, flood covers the earth, and we either change or we die. And this, this final question, it's an invitation to do some archaeological digging into your own soul and psyche and notice what matters to you more now than before all this began. Why it means more is actually almost unimportant. What matters is that something does. And you owe it to yourself to be aware of it. And as you do this, keep from noticing those parts of you that may have changed for the worse. Grumpiness, that extra bag of potato chips, selfishness, leave all that for another time. At this particular point, focus on identifying the fragments, the clues in your soul and psyche that point to something being more important now than you remember it being before. You know, the human personality is composed of traits and states. Traits are those parts of us consistent over time, the result of genetic expression occasioned by experience. And these traits represent a, a core of who we are. But a core is not enough of anything. Part of our personality is state-dependent, meaning we alter depending on the demands of our environment. One way of looking at time is as the record of how we, equipped with our states and traits, interact with and respond to the world that surrounds us. It is as if God has designed humanity with the capacity to create and recreate itself, interacting with the world that surrounds us. 
And that's also true with the soul. You know that temptation to, uh, to worship idols, things that never change, things that are always the same, always in the same place? That's tempting. It's easier. We worship a living God, a spirit that blows as it pleases. As Jesus says, we, we know neither where it comes from nor where it is going. We do know the sound that it makes. And in this time of pandemic, the time many have not survived, we listen to the sound of the spirit. And with the body and the brain God gave us, follow that spirit as best we can. Amen.